All right, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Saturday Engineering for Everyone lecture series. This is a lecture series that is organized by the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, my name is Naresh Shanbhag. I am a faculty member in this department. Uh, today I have a pleasure uh, of introducing the speaker, Professor uh, Linford Goddard from the EC department. Uh, before I introduce uh, Professor Goddard, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the lecture series for those of you who have just, who have come here for the first time. Uh, this is a lecture series that was inspired by a similar lecture series from the Department of Physics. And in fact, uh, the physics lecture series occurs in fall. So you're welcome to attend the physics lecture series in fall and then come to the ECE lecture series, electrical and computer engineering lecture series in spring. Um, I also want to thank two individuals, uh, Sneha and uh, Ian, who have been very responsible for making sure that we have food to eat and, and uh, we can record uh, the, the, this particular lecture. Uh, so with that, let me uh, introduce uh, the speaker for today. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to have uh, one of our distinguished member of our faculty, Professor Linford Goddard. Uh, Professor Goddard uh, received his PhD from Stanford University in 2005, and then uh, that was in physics, and then he worked for Lawrence Livermore Labs for two years, and then in 2007, he joined our department as an assistant professor. Uh, Professor Goddard's area of research is in photonics, which means photonics and semiconductor devices. What this means is that he's very interested in studying the properties of light and its uses for sensing, for measurement, for information transfer, and information processing. So it's called photonics and semiconductor uh, integrated circuits. That's the area of research. Um, I should also mention that in this area of research, Professor Gardard has been recognized worldwide for his contributions. And I'll just mention one of them. Uh, in uh, 2010, uh, he was awarded the NSF, National Science Foundation Career Award. Uh, this is an award that is uh, provided by NSF to promising junior faculty uh, from all across the United States. And uh, Professor Gardard was selected as, uh, as one of them. So that was a wonderful accomplishment. The other one is a uh, very special award that's called the PKs. Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. And what makes this award special is that all the awardees are invited to the White House and they get to shake hands with the president. And so Professor Gardner did shake hands with President Obama. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are, we are very proud of uh, Pro Professor Gardner and uh, glad to have him as a member of our faculty. Uh, so with that, um, final comment I want to make is I know that uh, uh, Professor Goddard is very much interested in outreach activities. And I know this because my own daughter has attended the games camp that he organizes. Games stands for um, girls in... Girls Adventures in Math, Engineering, and Science. And I know. only do the electrical engineering part. Electrical program. engineering part. So after my daughter attended uh, his uh, lecture series, that particular workshop, uh, she was enthused about this topic, and in fact, she's here today, um, and she has given up a, on, on her own volition, she has given up a birthday party to come to attend this lecture because she said, I can't miss a lecture by Professor Gardner. So with that introduction, I would like to invite uh, Professor Gardner to begin his seminar. Thank you very much, Naresh, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you to the organizing committee, uh, Professor Carney, Naresh, and um, the student volunteers um, for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, my excitement about uh, experimental research, and in particular on experimental design. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity to, to work with students at, at Illinois um, and to be able to run outreach programs with student volunteers. Um, as Naresh mentioned, um, I'm very involved in outreach activities. So um, the two main things that I'm involved in in the summer um, are being displayed up here. 
Um, there's two summer camps that I am working in, uh, games, so Girls Adventures in Math, Engineering, and Science. Um, it's for high school girls. Um, and there are a lot of different subfields of engineering that I cover. So uh, I only do the electrical engineering and, or electrical and computer engineering portion of it. There's also camps for mechanical engineering, computer science, uh, environmental engineering, aeronautical or aerospace engineering. Um, there's actually eight different camps. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for students to get an idea as to what they want to study uh, in college. Um, I'm also involved in the Illinois Summer Academies, um, so it's, that's, a four, that's a partnership with 4-H Club with their Leadership Academy. Um, so ne it's another opportunity for high school students to come to the campus and be able to interact with faculty and with students um, and learn about engineering. So I'm showing here is the application for these two different programs. Um, if you just Google search uh, University of Illinois and summer camps, um, engineering summer camps, uh, it'll take you to these. Um, so without uh, uh, further ado, let me just start my uh, talk on design of experiment, or rather a guide to good experimental design. Um, this particular talk I've given several times over the years. Um, I was invited back in 2010 to present this at the um, National Science Bowl in Washington, D.C., and for the family, um, the family what is it called, the Family Day at, of Science at, um, uh, tri by AAAS. Um, and then I offer this as part of one of my courses. So um, a lot of different audiences have seen this and hopefully you'll enjoy it. So shown here, um, there's an engineer who's working at uh, uh, an instrument and at his disposal, he has eight different controls. He can adjust the pressure, the temperature, the humidity, or sorry, the flow rate, the RF power, the bias, the current, rotation, and time. So this particular case is someone who's processing a semiconductor wafer. There's a lot of different uh, variables that they have at their disposal, and understanding how to find an optimal solution for a process or to be able to understand the effects of a variable um, with an efficient uh, experiment is the goal of today's talk. Um, so the outline, I'll first define a lot of terms. So unfortunately, I have to define for about eight or ten slides worth of material, um, just so that we have a common vocabulary and a common language to talk about our experimental design. Um, but I'll do it in terms of an experiment. So I'll talk about a specific hair growth experiment, and you'll be able to understand uh, the terminology. Um, and then we'll go into screening design. So the first thing I'll talk about is comparative designs, where we just want to see um, what effect a single variable has. The second uh, type of experiment we'll talk about are screening designs, where the goal is to understand which variable, like in this uh, guy's case, which of these eight variables are most important. And so being able to understand the sensitive variables is the goal. Um, there'll be an activity, so there'll be a hands-on activity where the audience gets to participate in. Um, and then time permitting, I'll talk about the full and fractional factorial experiments before concluding. So my first set of definitions, um, we want to distinguish between an observation and an experiment. And a lot of the public um, often mixes these up. And a lot of news reporters, um, hopefully there's not a lot of news reporters in the audience, um, they tend to uh, mix these two terms up. So let's first talk about an observation. Um, and in an observation, the goal is to observe and measure variables without trying to uh, influence the response. So you have no control over the system. You're just watching what happens as uh, something uh, progresses. In an experiment, which is the main difference, um, you deliberately impose some type of treatment in order to observe a response. So you're going to intentionally interact with the system so that you can um, cause a response. So if you design it correctly, an experiment can give evidence for causation. However, an observation cannot. Oops. OK, so let's talk about the first experiment. So the first experiment is a hair growth experiment. So imagine that you work at a pharmaceutical company, and your, boss and your team has just discovered this new hair grow TM. It's this new shampoo that helps grow uh, more hair. So um, you're going to you're actively going to try to patent it, and so you've seen these results. So in month one, there's no hair. Month 13, there's lots of hair. So your boss, though, is a little bit skeptical. He says, design an experiment to evaluate how valid this claim is. We can't go to our shareholders and, and promote this product until we know for sure that it's what's causing the hair growth. So you have to design an experiment to evaluate the claim. 
So some definitions. The first definition is the factor. The factor is the explanatory variable. It's also known as the independent variable. So it's x. It's what you're varying. It's the treatment. It's, it's what you're going to vary in order to look for the response. So at your disposal, you can try the hair growth formula, or you can try plain shampoo. And what you want to compare is the response um, uh, to this particular factor. So the factor is the explanatory variable, and then the factor can have different levels. The level is the specific value of this particular treatment. So you can have one level, which is one teaspoon of the hair growth formula, or you can have a different level, which is four teaspoons of the um, hair growth formula. So the different levels are the specific values of that treatment. Now, when you design an experiment, you want to choose a wide range. Um, you want to choose a wide range so you can explore the full parameter space. Um, but you also have to be careful that it's a safe range, like you don't want to have uh, something that uh, is too high of a concentration of something. Um, and you also want to select a useful range. So you wouldn't tell your client, okay, you have to put 32 bottles of the shampoo in order to, or the formula in order to grow one hair. So you want to select a useful range, a wide range, and a safe range. Okay, so let's do, uh, uh, so I'm going to step aside from that hair growth formula uh, experiment, and let's do a single variable experiment. So I have with me um, three tuning forks. So I have tuning forks of different lengths. So I have a long one, I have a medium-sized one, and I have a small one. Um, and the experiment that I want to study um, is how does the length of the tuning fork affect the frequency that it produces? So this is a scientific question that we want to, to study. So we have three different forks. So we want to set up our design of experiment and use the terminology that I def just defined. So length is the factor. It's what we're going to vary. So we're going to vary the length of it. And what we're going to measure is the frequency or the response. How does it sound? So we're going to figure out how does the frequency depend on the length. Okay. So I should ask the audience, um, which one do you think is going to produce the higher pitch? OK, so we have some musicians in the audience. So the <laughs> musicians in the audience say that the smaller one will produce the higher uh, response. So let's validate that. Oops, let's validate that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to plot the frequency response as a function of the length of the tuning fork. So our x variable, which is the explanatory variable, which is going to explain the response, is going to go on the horizontal axis. And the y, which is the independent variable, or it's also known as the response variable, this is going to be what we measure. So we're going to see how does it depend on the length. So I'm going to uh, measure one length. So let's start off with the shortest one first. Oops. <laughs> You gotta hold it. Okay, everyone hear that one? Okay, now we play a slightly longer one. Was that higher or lower? Lower. Lower, okay. And now we play the longest one. Okay, so that's the lowest. So what we're doing is um, we varied the, uh, the, we varied the uh, explanatory variable x and we measured the response variable y. So we measure for uh, a bunch of different lengths. And what we find is that um, as you make the tuning fork longer, the frequency that it plays gets lower. And we can graph this. So we measure a bunch of different lengths, and we graph it. So this is a single variable experiment. Question? Frank, after your other experiment, what's a reasonable sample size that you need? Okay. So the Okay, so the question is, um, going back to the previous experiment, what's a reasonable sample size you need for an accurate result? Um, so I'll talk about sample, slide, uh, sample size in a couple of, of slides, but that's a good question. You're anticipating, and it's good when the audience knows what's going to come next. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Okay, so you can actually uh, measure or fit this response to an uh, inverse square law. So it actually turns out that the frequency is inversely proportional to the square of the, the length. So what we've been able to answer in our experiment is how does the length of the tuning fork affect the frequency. OK, so now, um, as the gentleman from the audience pointed out, let's talk about sampling. So we first have to distinguish or differentiate between what's a census and what's a sample. So a census involves studying the entire population. So I don't know if people remember the 2010 census. P 
People from the government came around every single neighborhood. They asked how many people live in your house, how many men, how many women, what age group or what ages they are. Um, it's very expensive and very time consuming. It's a massive amount of data and it's great data, but you can't conduct a census uh, every single time you want to answer a question. So what we do, so this picture here, it's supposed to represent uh, 250 million people in the US or 300 million people, the current population. Um, so what we do is instead of studying um, the entire population, what we can do is we can study a sample of the population. So we study a part of the population in order to draw information or gain information about the whole population. And as gentleman pointed out, if I make the sample size bigger, the better my, my, be the better my inference about the way that the population will behave. So I need a large enough sample that I can make solid conclusions, but if I make too large of a sample, it's gonna be very time and, and uh, resource intensive. Now there are different ways that I can do the sampling. So the first way is I can do a simple random sample. So what I can do is out of the original full population, I just randomly pick a certain number of people with equal selection probability. So I pick her and I pick him and I pick him and I pick him and I pick her. So I pick people at random out of the audience and I ask you a question. So that would be a simple random sample. The larger I make it, the more accurate uh, it is. The important thing with a simple random sample is um, the probability that I select you should be the same regardless of what your demographics are. Now there's another type of sampling called stratified random sampling. In stratified random sampling, what I first want to do is to divide the population up into groups that are similar so that I can draw conclusions about how a specific group behaves. So I divide each group into uh, strata and I do a simple random sample on each group. So for example, if I want to compare the differences on how men and women respond to my hair growth formula, I should first divide the population into men and women and then within the men, I pick a certain number of people to be uh, part of my uh, experiment or my, part of my uh, my measurements, and a certain number of women uh, will be part of the, the trial. And so I do a simple random sample, so I randomly pick 10 men, I randomly pick 10 women uh, to be able to uh, do my, uh, my study. Okay, so I do a simple random sample on each group, and I draw conclusions about the group. Okay, some more definitions. Um, experimental units. These are the individuals or things on which the experiment is done. Um, so for example, the experimental units would be people in the hair grow experiment. I'd have a bunch of different people as my experimental uh, units. Um, there's something called a placebo effect. The placebo effect, a lot of patients just respond uh, knowing that they have a treatment, even if the treatment is not actually a real treatment, it's just a dummy pill. Um, and so, for example, in this experiment, the placebo that we would give would be plain shampoo so that we can compare whether our formula is actually doing something. Um, we want to have a control group. A control group is the group that uh, receives the placebo, so we can compare the effects of the treatment to a group that's received the placebo. Um, some more definitions. I think this is the last slide of definitions. Um, confounding variables. So there's always an uh, infinite number of variables that can explain a particular event or a particular process. Um, some of them the scientist or engineer knows about, and these are the variables under their control. There are other variables that the researcher doesn't know about, and these are called lurking variables. They may explain the relationship between the explanatory variable and the response variable. And so there's a statement that says just because you have high correlation, meaning that the things are related, it doesn't imply that it's causation. So you don't always know that one thing causes another. So in this hair growth experiment, um, one of the possible lurking variables is the source of the hair loss. So for example, some people have androgenic alopecia and some people have hereditary things that um, affect their hair loss. There could be another variable. There could be daily lifestyle. So diet is known to affect um, uh, hair growth and also poor hair care. So these lurking variables, these are variables that this researcher in his experiment is unaware of when he's constructing the experiment. And so as a result of being unaware of these, there can be what's known as confounding, which is the effects of the response variable do the explanatory variable and or the lurking variables, you can't tell what's causing it. There, it could be the lurking variables, it could be the um, explanatory variables that are causing the one thing to work or not to work. Okay, so I should pause. Any questions? 
I haven't answered the guy's question about how many experiments you need to do. I may have to answer that one offline. <laughs> It's a more complicated question. Um, OK, any other questions? No? OK, so yeah. Well, I say infinite in that you can always think of another variable that could possibly describe it. So when you think you've made a list, I can say, well, the temperature, well, the humidity, well, the day of the week, stuff like that. So you can just constantly add variables that may explain it. They may not actually explain it. <laughs> Right, so we didn't talk about the density of the material, the width of the tuning fork, the, um, the separation, what material, uh, whether we're in air versus in uh, a liquid or something like that. Okay, okay so continuing on. So uh, how do we get around this problem of confounding variables? How do we separate what we're interested in, which is the explanatory variables, from these noise factors, which are the confounding variables? Um, there's something called a block design, and in a block design, you randomly assign treatments within each block of similar individuals, and you analyze each block separately. So for example, if uh, gender plays a role, so this could be a possible confounding variable, first what we should do is we should separate the group into men and women, and then randomly assign some men uh, our treatment, which is one teaspoon of uh, our hair growth formula, or one treatment, one teaspoon of our placebo, which is plain shampoo. And then we want to compare the results. We want to see, for men, does this hair growth formula produce a noticeable improvement? And then we're also going to study for women. We're going to see, does the hair growth formula produce a noticeable improvement? And we want to separate them initially because gender could be a variable that has an effect. And so we don't want to confound the effect of gender with the variable which we want to study, which is our formula. There's another way that we can get around the problem of confounding, and that's called match pair design. So in a match pair design, it's a common form of blocking where the subject receives two treatments in sequence um, in random order, or you get a pair of twins. You get people that are identical in every way except the treatment that you give them. So you have a pair, and so this could be uh, a pair of twins, or you can have one person do it in twice, just in different orders. Um, you randomly assign them whether they receive the hair growth formula or whether they receive the shampoo, and you compare the result. So for one pair of twins, you see it works. Another pair of twins, it's not very effective. Another pair of twins, it works. Another pair, it's not effective. And you compare all these different results, and you come up with a conclusion as to 50% um, of the time it helps. And so then that will lead you to, to further studies. But at least you have a way um, to do comparison. Um, the, the whole thing that I'm talking about at the beginning, it's very important that you compare. So one of the key things in a good experimental design um, is that there's a comparison being made. Okay. So this is the most important slide for today. Um, I'm going to make sure that everyone understands it and that we go through it very carefully because this summarizes everything that I want you to learn from um, today. There are three key principles to good experimental design. If you follow these three key principles, then your experimental design will be good. The first is that you need to control the effects of lurking variables by comparing. So you're going to compare two or more different treatments. So you have to construct groups that are identical in every way except for the treatment. Then if you see there's a difference in the treatment, you've been able to get rid of all these other lurking variables because the groups are supposed to be identical in every single way. Now, you may not be able to construct the groups identical in every single way on your first try. So what you do is you randomize the assignment of the experimental units to the treatments to reduce the effect of lurking variables. If I just said, OK, I'm going to pick the people on this side of the room, which may be more men than this side of the room, and I give them one treatment and I give this other group the other treatment, um, I didn't do a good enough job of randomizing, and so I may be confounding the effects of lurking variables. So you randomize the assignment so that you can construct groups that are equal to each other or uh, identical in every way except for the treatment. And then the last thing that you need to do is you need to replicate each treatment enough times to reduce the effects of chance variation. There's always going to be randomness. There's always going to be noise. And so if you do many different experiments, many trials, so going back to the question, how many trials do you need to do? Um, if you do enough trials, then you're able to reduce this effect. And so if your data is what's known as normal, so Gaussian distributed, 
Um, if you do averaging, so you make a lot of different measurements and you average the results, then you reduce the effect of the variation. And so the larger the sample size, the better the conclusions you can draw. So the three, key, the three key principles, you have to control by comparison, you have to randomize, and you have to replicate. Um, there's a quote attributed to George Box, a famous statistician, that says, block what you can, randomize what you can't. So in the blocking, you try to group them as much uh, into identical groups as you can, but you can't create that many groups. Um, you can't have thousands of groups. It'll be very hard to have enough people in each group. Um, so you do randomization against the other variables um, so that you can uh, get rid of the effects of confounding. So control, randomization, and replication are the three key principles. Any questions on this slide? It's very important that everyone understands this. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, is it just increase the sample size, or uh, within the same sample size, you can do some design of replication? Okay, so the question is, for replication, do you mean uh, increase the sample size, or within the sample that you have, just do more experiments? Um, it could be both. Um, most of the time, what you do is you increase the sample size, so you try more different people because um, the sample that you like, the sample that you or the sample the people that you initially pick in your simple random sample, um, they may not be representative well enough of the population. So generally, if you big, pick a bigger sample size, then you can reduce the effect that the sample that you originally picked was somehow biased in some way. So usually, you pick a larger sample size. Now, if you're unable to pick a larger sample size, you can try doing more experiments with the sample size that you have. But it's, it's, it, it doesn't help you as much as if you pick different people. So picking different people would be better. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, so time and what, thing, what things change over time. So that's one of the reasons picking the same person multiple times is not a very good idea because they have prior exposure and prior treatments. So ideally, you want to have new people to be able to um, not have any uh, prior exposure or prior effects. Other questions? OK, so let's keep going. Ah, my advancer is no longer working. Okay, so let's study um, a bunch of different experimental designs, and we're going to evaluate whether these are good designs or bad designs. So uh, we want to de demonstrate cause and effect, and so we want to look at certain types of designs. TX means that a treatment is made during an interval. OBS means that an observation is made. And double dash means that nothing happens or a placebo occurs during that time slot. Um, so what we're going to show is we're going to have like group one and group two, and time progresses on the horizontal axis. So design A, so we randomly assign people to group one and to group two. Um, we give group one the treatment, we give group two the placebo, and then we observe the two results. And so is this a good experimental to design? What we have to answer is, does it satisfy the three key principles? Yes, there's control by comparison because we're going to control, we're going to compare groups one and two. Yes, there's random assignment to people uh, in groups one and group two, so that's good. And replication. So when we say group, we're going to assume that there's enough people in the group that uh, we have uh, good replication. So this is a good experimental design. And what does it tell us? Well, if we see a difference between group one and group two, we have evidence that the treatment uh, uh, causes the observed difference. Notice we don't have proof. And this is a key point that a lot of people forget. Just because you see a difference, you don't have proof. You just have evidence that there's a, a, a causal relationship. What about this design? We have one group. We give them a treatment. We make an observation. Is this a good experimental design? No. Do we have control by comparison? No. Do we have replication or random assignment? No. Do we have replication? Uh, maybe. Um, so this. Experiment, in quotes, uh, can show evidence really of nothing, just that the observation happened after the treatment. Now, this type of experiment happens a lot. I don't know how many sports fans there are in the audience, um, but if you ever listen to ESPN and you hear stats like, Illinois football is 26-0 when they rush for 400 yards. 
that's this experiment. So the observation is they win. The treatment is they ran for 400 yards. So the people think, oh, all we have to do is run for 400 yards and we'll win all the games. So no, that's not a good experiment. That just shows um, one thing happens after the other. Um, parents are very famous for this experiment. Um, parents will say, um, I see you have a cold today. That's because you were standing outside in the rain yesterday. So that's the treatment is the kids stand outside in the rain. The observation is they have a cold. Therefore, standing outside in the rain causes colds. Parents do this all the time. <laughs> Not a good experimental design. OK, what about this design? We randomly assign people to group one and group two. We make an observation before. We give a treatment to group one. We do nothing for group two. We make an observation after. Is this a good design? Yes, so we have control by comparison, we have random assignment, and we have replication. So this is a good experimental design. What do you think this design can show that the other one couldn't? What's the difference between these? The fact that I have an observation before. A before and after effect. We can see whether there's a change in response. So the key is, um, in the first case, we see that there's a difference in response. In this case, we can see a change in response. So now we can see, is there evidence that the treatment causes a change in the response? What about this design? We have four groups. We randomly assign people to four groups. Group one gets treatment one and then treatment two and then observe. Group two gets treatment one and placebo and observes. Group three gets nothing and, and treatment two and then observes. Group four gets placebo twice. So good experimental design. Yes, we have, random, we have control by comparison, we have random assignment, we have replication. Now, this has two different treatments, treatment one and treatment two. So what do you think this experimental design is, what's the goal of this experimental design? Look at the interaction between them. Okay, so look at the interaction between treatment one and treatment two. So it can tell us several things if we compare the right groups. So if we compare group three and group four, what can that tell us? If treatment two is useful by itself. If we compare group two and group four, that tells us treatment one by itself is effective. If we compare group one and group three, we can see whether treatment one and treatment two is better than treatment two alone. If we compare one and two, we can see treatment one and treatment two is better than just treatment one alone. Compare group one and group four, that's treatment one and two versus nothing. So there's actually six comparisons we can make, so four choose two. Um, comparisons that we can make. And so what this shows is that it can show evidence that treatment one or treatment two individually cause a re uh, response, as well as both taken together, whether they cause the same response or a different response. So this is what's known as a two-factor experiment. Okay, so now let's get into some screening designs. I think I have to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, and then we'll talk about the LED activity. Um, so we have a process, and this can be a system, this could be uh, nature, um, it can be uh, anything. Um, and what we have is we have a bunch of inputs and we have some outputs. So the inputs are um, things that we can control. So we have these factors that are under our control, like temperature, humidity, pressure, and so forth. Um, or uh, these are things that we can control. Um, there's uncontrollable inputs. Um, sorry, so temperature and humidity we can't control, let's say. Um, but let's say that we can control like our uh, spin rate or the pressure or something else. Um, and then there's uncontrolled cofactors that can be discrete, such as different operators or different machines, and they're continuous ones like temperature and humidity. And we put all these inputs into the process, and the process spits out a bunch of different outputs. So this could be like we put in our hair growth formula, but then these inputs could be like different ages of people, and this could be different uh, ethnicities or different genders, and then whether it works or whether it doesn't are our outputs. Um, a screening design, so the comparative design, which is what I talked about initially, we're just trying to compare whether treatment uh, produces a response. In a screening design, the goal is to figure out which of the many factors are important. So both the inputs, which are the factors, and the outputs, which are the responses, we need to pick them carefully so that they match realistic conditions. And we usually assume that there's a linear relationship between the input and the output. So how do, we how do we accurately measure the slope for a linear relation? Because that's going to be uh, what we're typically after. And the answer is we want to measure y for widely spaced x. And what we can see is, let's say that we want to measure the density of steel. So the density is the ratio of the mass per volume. So we have two different experiments. In this experiment, we measure two very closely spaced volumes, and we measure the two masses. In this case, we measure two widely spaced volumes and we determine the mass. In which case are we going to get the more accurate slope? 
kind of gave it away. It's, it's in the second case. We can draw um, one line that can pass through those two data points. Whereas in the first case, there are a bunch of different lines and a bunch of different slopes that pass through those two data points. So if we want to measure the slope accurately, we should space our x variable as far apart as we can, but it has to be within a safe range of uh, values. The next thing to look at is the multivariable screening experiment. So let's say that we have two variables, x1 and x2. So these are two possible things that can explain our response. And each one is going to have a low setting, which is negative 1, or a high setting, which is plus 1. So this is negative 1 for x1, and then plus 1 for x1 and then negative 1 for x2, and plus 1 for x2. So there are four points, and you'll notice that this particular design is identical to our design D, where we have two different treatments. And so, for example, if x1 and x2 are high, that could be something like we're giving this our hair growth formula, and we're also doing another treatment, which could be an improved diet, for example. So let's say our second factor is diet, and our first factor is our hair growth formula. So this point can represent a hair growth formula plus good diet. This point could represent hair growth formula plus poor diet. This point could be good diet but um, uh, placebo shampoo. And this could be bad diet and uh, placebo shampoo. So we have two factors, uh, hair growth formula or shampoo, and we have uh, good diet versus bad diet. And so we have four possible combinations, and we represent it graphically uh, in this x1, x2 plane. OK, so let's do a hands-on activity. So I'll need some help from the audience. I'm going to ask Naresh and Ashita to help me pass things out. Um, so what I'm going to pass out, um, we're going to pass out these bags. Um, you're going to pair up in groups of two and or three, so family or two. Um, and each person is going to carry out a two-factor experiment. Just grab a bunch of bags, and it doesn't matter which ones. Yeah. And I'll pass them out. Or maybe I can get one more volunteer. One more volunteer. Actually. Can I have you distribute? Oh, Lana will distribute. OK, so you'll do kind of the back. Yeah, you can look inside. So each bag is going to have uh, a battery clip, um, batteries, an LED, and a resistor. So pair up. I made a mistake. I need one. Okay, so let me show you what you have in your your in your bag. Um, so there's a battery clip. There's a battery. Um, you put your battery inside the battery clip, of course. Um, when you use this battery in the battery clip, um, just be sure not to accidentally touch the plus and minuses together. Um, what will happen is the battery will get very, very hot because you're going to flow current uh, through the battery. And surprisingly, um, even with the <laughs> just a single AA battery, um, you can hurt yourself uh, if you short these together. So um, these have clips at the end, and you push the clips to clip onto things, but don't touch them to each other. OK, so you have battery and battery clip. Um, you have an individual clip by itself, so a clip by itself. Um, you have a light emitting diode, so light emitting diode, or LED. It's this plastic thing with two legs. And you have a resistor. So the resistor is just two metal lines and a small uh, plastic body inside. Now, the LED has uh, a long leg and a short leg. So if you straighten these out a little bit, you can see one leg is longer than the other. Everyone see that? OK. So what we're going to do 
I don't know if we can do a split screen where one screen shows me and one screen shows the PowerPoint. OK. Oh, it's doing that. Perfect. <laughs> I need to look that way. <laughs> OK, so we're going to carry out a two-factor experiment to determine under which conditions the LED will light up. Now, as independent researchers, it's very important that you don't talk to any of the other teams. You're going to work on your team, and your team is going to work by itself. OK, so you guys are independent. Um, we want independent results. So there are going to be two factors that we're going to study. The first factor is um, whether we connect the red wire from the battery to the shorter leg or the longer leg of the LED, and whether we put the resistor and the LED in either series or parallel. And I'll explain what series and parallel is um, on this next slide. OK, so we're first going to do, so I'll, I'll walk you through this. Um, we're first going to do. Um, the parallel configuration with the red connected to the short. So we look at the picture, and the parallel configuration says um, we're going to put the LED and the resistor, we're going to clip the two ends together. Now, you can clip the two ends together with the battery clip, so you don't need the small uh, metal clip by itself. So first, what you should do is decide which side is the long side. So you pick the side that's the long side. So we're going to try connecting the red to the short side. So we're going to take the short side of the LED, clip it to one side of the resistor, and clip it with the black part, or sorry, with the red part of the, um, of the battery clip. So you have right now, so we're doing the upper left corner. So we're checking the red wire to the short leg and parallel configuration. So we do red wire connected to the short leg, connected to the resistor. Everyone got that? Question? You used the phrase parallel when you said upper left. So sorry, we're doing this box. So we're doing that box where it's parallel short leg. Sorry. So that box, parallel short leg. So we have the red connected to the short leg, connected to the resistor. And then we're going to take the black and connect on the other end to the LED and to the resistor. And we're going to see, did it light up? And what you have to do is you have to keep track of under which configuration it lit up. So if yours lit up, you're going to write down or you're just going to remember um, that it's lit up. Yeah, so the first configuration is the red wire. And so these clips, you push, and then they come out this clip. Um, so you push, and you connect the red to the short and to the resistor. Um, I just clip both of them together. So when you push at the bottom of this, there's a clip. And then you clip both of those together. Yes, the battery is already plugged into your battery clip. OK. Other questions so far? So I'm walking around so people can see. So I have the red clip clipped to the short leg and also clipped to the resistor. So I just clip both of them together. And then the other side, I clip both of them together. And feel free to ask questions if you're getting stuck on this first configuration. So you have to spread the LED legs uh, to the sides a bit so that you can clip them on either side. So I clip the red to one LED short leg and also to the resistor. And then the other side, I clip the black to the LED and the resistor. Anyone yeah. stuck? Um, ah, and sometimes the, I'm going to show their clip. Um, sometimes the clip pushes out. So what you have to do is you have to, uh, you have to twist this knob a little bit until it uh, realigns and then goes back in. Um, yeah. It's like, I'm worried if you twist it. Yeah, you can push it a little bit. 
Anyone else stuck? Uh, yeah. And then this goes. And that clips to one oh, side. Yep. Here. So you clip there, and you also clip the LED to that as well. Oh, so put both of those yeah, in. Yeah, put both of those in. So is it the short one or the long one goes in the red? Um, we're doing the upper left corner, so the short one. The short one. Yeah, the short one, and you put the same thing in there, too. Yep. Hi. <laughs> Hi, right. so we're not sure exactly how to. Set it here. Oh, okay. Oops. So let's do. So this. Oh, okay, puts it apart. Okay. And there we go. Yeah, and then you clip that. All right. There. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Yeah. Except. Oh, this one. This one. Wasn't also, sure the top but, yeah. Oops. Okay. So these, the yeah, bones? those two together. Oh, and then okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Has everyone been able to get the first configuration? Question. You got it. Okay. So the upper left. Okay. So you keep track in your mind. Did it light up for the short leg parallel configuration? Okay. So you have to write down or just keep track. Did it light up? The next one, yeah, parallel. The next one we're doing the short, we're doing the long leg, so we're still going to do parallel. All we have to do is flip the LED. So the easiest way is just disconnect both sides and just switch where you had the black to where you had the red. But do it one at a time. Make sure you disconnect both of them and then switch. Don't disconnect one, move the other, because then you'll have two connected to each other and the battery will get hot. So disconnect both of them and then switch the left, the short leg with the right leg. Or the short leg with the long leg. Anyone need help? <laughs> okay. Okay, so you tried both cases, um, the short leg and the long leg. Everyone, has everyone tried both cases? Anyone not tried both cases? Okay, so now let's move to series configuration. So now what we want to do is series with the short leg. So what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect both of these. We're going to set the battery thing aside for a second. We're going to connect the resistor and the LED with the separate clip. So you can pick which one you want as the long leg and the short leg. It's not going to matter um, which one you connect to the resistor. But you may need to twist the two together a little bit in order to clip them. So you're going to clip with the metal clip one of the legs of the LED and one of the legs of the resistor. So the first step is you just clip together, because what we're doing is we're going to make this connection. Yeah. We're going to make this connection in between. So we're going to clip together the LED and the resistor first. OK, so we're doing series now. OK, everyone clip together their LED and their resistor, one of the legs. OK. The next step is we're going to see if we connect the black to, so we're going to do the bottom left. So we're going to do the red to the short leg. So you have to remember which side was the short leg and which side was the long leg. And if you connected the short leg in the middle, so we need to think about this a little bit, but, or let's just do it this way. Um, connect the red to one of your LED legs and connect the black to the resistor. And if you, OK, so you connected the LED leg and the resistor in the middle. You connected the red to one of the LEDs, and you connected the black to the resistor. 
And what you're going to write, if your short leg is the one that the red is closest to, you're going to write in this column. If your long leg is the one that the red leg is connected to, you're going to write in the other column. Did I confuse people? <laughs> so the center part, we clip together the LED and the resistor. The left side, we have the red connected to the LED, the black connected to the resistor. If my short leg is on the red, then I say it's the left column. If my long leg is on the red, then I say it's my right column. Okay, has everyone gotten the series configuration? Are there questions about the series configuration? Anyone stuck? Okay, everyone did the first series configuration? Does it light up? Okay, next you're going to switch the black and the red. So disconnect the black, disconnect the red, connect the red to the resistor, connect the black to the LED. And so that's the other column in the table. Or the other entry in the table. Um, it doesn't matter which side you put it on. Um, so when you clip the LED and the resistor together, what's important is did the red touch the, is the red closest to the long leg or is the red closest to the short leg? Other questions? Everyone having fun? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Do people need more time, or has everyone been able to try all four configurations? Who needs more time? One, two, three. Okay. Yeah, the, and surprisingly, the clips are an improvement. Before, what we used to do is we used to have the people hold the wires together with their fingers. So that, that was a lot harder. So at least now we have clips. Okay, so you've recorded all four configurations whether it worked or whether it didn't work. Okay, now I'm going to ask the audience uh, for their responses. So let's see how well, oops, how well we did. So how many people had parallel short leg work? Anyone? Parallel with the red connected to the short leg. We have four. Okay, what about parallel with the red connected to the long leg? And only raise one hand per group. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. What about a uh, series with short leg? No one. And what about series with long leg? No one. Okay. So one small thing. Um, the people who did parallel and had the red connected to the short leg, um, can you redo your experiment? <laughs> it was supposed to be zero. Okay, so this one is supposed to be zero. Um, and then the people who did parallel with the long leg, um, so 12 groups worked. How many groups did not get theirs to work at all? Uh, one hand per group. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay, so there are 11 cases where it didn't work. Okay, so that should make us pause and think. So what should it make us pause and think about? Whenever I see variation on a specific setting, that's a good indication that there is a confounding variable. So there's a lurking variable that the researchers, you, are unaware of. So the people whose ones didn't work at all versus the people whose ones worked talk to each other and try to figure out what's the difference between your kits. So the people whose didn't work, raise your hand. OK, so you see who they are? So talk to those groups and find out why theirs didn't work. OK, 
Those are extras. Say it again. Some of them weren't supposed to work, were they? Right. <laughs> <laughs> The number on the back. <laughs> That's a good clue. <laughs> Okay, so let's, let's discuss it. So you had a chance to talk to people, and I heard one of the correct answers. So some groups had two batteries, some groups had one battery. There's one other lurking variable. Anyone figure out what the other variable is? The color. Okay, so some groups had what? Blue. Some groups had red. Okay, so now let's look at this. So why does it only work in certain cases? Well, there's uh, variations at certain settings may indicate lurking variables. So you guys talk to see what was overlooked. So some groups had one AA, some groups had two. Now we can do this other experiment, but we actually have the results already. For the groups that had one AA, or let's, let's do it this way. Um, the groups that had two AA in red, oops. The groups that had two AA in red, did yours work? Yes. What about one AA in red? Anyone have one AA in it light up? Yes. Okay. What about two AA in blue? Did it light up? Yes. The groups that had theirs not work, I'm going to give it away. You guys had one AA and you had a blue LED. So this is a hidden variable or two hidden variables that were in this experiment. And we'll now understand uh, why. Um, it only worked in certain configurations, okay? So the key conclusions of this experiment, can I get everyone's attention again? Um, the key conclusions of this experiment, the red wire must be connected to the longer LED leg. So there's a uh, pneumatic. Um, LEDs are our PAL, meaning that the positive, which is the red wire of the battery, must be connected to the anode of the LED, which is the longer of the two legs. Um, the resistors must be connected in parallel. So what a resistor does is it blocks current. Now, typically when you use an LED, you actually want to put a resistor in series to, accident, to prevent it accidentally overheating, but you use a very small resistance. So the correct configuration normally is to put it in series, but use a very small resistance. The resistors I gave you were very, very large, so they're going to block all the current. And so only in parallel will it light up. Now, the red LEDs, so this is not in the notes, so you may want to write this down, but the red LEDs will light up with either one AA or two AA's, um, but the blue need two AA's to turn on. And the reason for this is that the turn on voltage, the energy of the light, is 1.9 volts for the red, and it's about 2.9 for the blue. Now, the batteries that I gave you, these are one and a half volts. So if you had one AA battery, you barely saw the light come on. So it's just barely enough to produce some light, but not that much. Um, but for the blue, it's just too far away from what you need to turn it on. So in blue, it didn't turn on unless you had the two AA's. Now, this is an example that shows that if you do small experiments, uh, you can figure out results very quickly. Notice we actually had four factors in our experiment. We had long, short, we had uh, series parallel, we had one AA, two AA, and we had red and blue. If you consider that there's actually 16 different experiments we would have had to do to check all those different configurations, that would have taken us a long time. But we broke it up into a small experiment first, where we did a uh, series in parallel and long and short first, and then we discovered there are these two other variables, and we actually already had the results. We didn't have to do more experiment. But it saved us a lot of, of work. OK, so in the final uh, few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about the the design of experiment. So the full factorial design, we study every single possible combination. So if I have one factor, I have a low and a high setting, so I have two experiments. If I have two factors, I have uh, low and high settings for each, so I have two times two. If I have three factors, I have two times two times two. I have eight possible combinations. Every time I add a factor, I double the number of experiments that I have to do. 
So too many runs occur once I have about five factors. No one wants to do 64 experiments, so that's going to take way too long. Let's study a three-factor experiment. A three-factor experiment, what I can do, I can have my first factor. It's going to alternate between low and high every, uh, every different run. I'm going to alternate between low and high. The second, the second factor, it alternates every other one. And then the third one, it alternates every four. If I look at this, these eight points correspond to eight points on the cube. And this tells me how to pick the eight points that I'm going to do my experiments on. Now let's say that I created a design of experiment that looked like this. And I did this one first, that one second, that one third, and so forth. Is this a good experimental design? The answer is no. I don't have, well, I have control by comparison, yes, but I don't have random assignment. The problem is these are not in uh, random order. So the order in which I run these may affect the results. And I don't have replication. I'm only running this once. So every single configuration, I only have one experiment. So randomization is going to reduce the effects of lurking variables. And what I would do is construct a random order. Let's say I did a 2x replication. Um, I would put this in random order. And I would run it, run 7, then 2, 2, 6, 8, and so forth, so that I get enough measurements to be able to get rid of chance variation. And I run it in a random order so that I get rid of the effects of the sequence. Um, I won't, OK, so the last thing to talk about is fractional factorial. So fractional factorial, the idea is, when, what do I do when I have five or more experiments, that, or five or more factors? That's way too many. Um, so we can make certain assumptions to figure out which factors are uh, important and which interactions are important. And we can make conclusions with fewer runs. So the answer is yes, um, and these are called fractional factorial. So in the previous example, the first case I looked at was I consider all eight possible configurations. Now I can do what's known as a fractional factorial, which is 2 to the 3 minus 1. 3 is the number of factors. 1 is how much I've reduced the complexity of my experimental design by. And 4 is the number of runs that I need to, to run. So if I look at just the points in the red, if I do those measurements, that's enough for me to tell which of the four factors is important. I don't have to try all eight possible cases. And the reason is, if I compare experiment 2 and 8 versus 3 and 5, I can see is factor x1 important? Let's say these two points, it has good results, and these two points have bad results. I can say factor 1 being on means that I have good results. Now I can also compare 3 and 8 versus 2 and 5. And I can see does factor 3 and 8, does factor x2 rather, um, produce a result between comparing 3 and 8 versus 2 and 5. I can also compare um, 2 and 3 versus 5 and 8. And I can see whether this third factor, x3, is important. And so I can get all the information I want if I neglect interactions. So I'm assuming that there's no interactions between these different factors. But I can figure out which factor is most important out of these three factors. And I can do it with four experiments instead of doing it with eight. Now, a more exaggerated example of this, if I had seven factors, um, I can actually figure it out in eight experiments. So instead of having to do 128 experiments, I can actually do it in eight. And this is what's known as a, um, as a fully reduced uh, fractional factorial experiment, where I have seven factors, but I've reduced it by four orders. And so I only have eight experiments to do. And you can check that if I pick the right four of these experiments to compare with four of these, I can figure out what factor uh, or what effect an individual factor has. So for example, if I compare the odd ones with the even ones, I can see whether factor one by itself is important. If I compare 1 and 2 and 5 and 6 with 3 and 4 and 7 and 8, I can see whether x2 by itself is important. And I can do this for each one of these factors. So with just eight runs, I can figure out which of seven variables is the most important in my experiment. And this saves us a lot of time by doing this uh, fractional factorial design. Um, so the key conclusions for today, um, a good experimental design, this is the most important thing to take away. A good experimental design uses control by comparison, um, randomization to reduce the effect of lurking variables, and replication to reduce chance variation. Um, I showed the full factorial screening design. It works very well if I have a few number of factors. Like if I have two factors like you did with the LED, or if I have three or four, then it's OK. Um, if I want to do more factors, um, then I should do a fractional factorial design. So I'll end here. Um, please put the stuff back in the bag, and uh, I'll collect it. 
If there's educators in the audience who want to do something like this with their class, come see me afterwards. Um, I can distribute some of these kits to you. Um, and you can uh, also get the lecture material if you want to share with your class. And if there's kids in the audience who really want uh, this kit, um, come up to me and afterwards and I'll, I'll give you uh, one of them. Um, be sure to take the batteries out of the battery clip before you put it back in the bag. And thank you for your time today. Illinois.